Okay, everybody, welcome back to the Tomcat track on Tuesday, September 29th. Andrew Carr is going to present deploying a production instance where he discusses um, how to deploy consistent, reliable, dependable, and hardened Tomcat instances into your various environments. Welcome, and thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I. Uh... I would like to think they are uh, persistent and dependable and reliable and hardened, but you know how it is. Um, it's only as, uh, as good as your experience allows it to be. Um, uh, I've been doing Tomcat discussions for about uh, 15 years. Uh, I've been writing Java since the early 2000s and uh, I've been uh, into software for about 20 years. Uh, I started in the 90s though as a hobbyist uh, in networking and building custom PCs. Um, and then through my teen years, I, I really got into programming and then started professionally programming in the early 2000s. Um, I worked for a number of different companies and I've written software for pretty much every kind of environment. And I don't want to concentrate too much on me. Uh, but I am there to help with Tomcat. I'm on the mailing list. Uh, so uh, I normally get a lot of questions after these conferences, which I've done for about 10 years now. Um, not ApacheCon. This is my first ApacheCon. Uh, but uh, I've been doing conferences for about 10 years. Uh, and the most response is probably from ZenCon where I would get a lot of uh, follow-up questions and, and follow-up implementation examples and requests for reviews, et cetera. Uh, so I'm available for that. Uh, I've been involved with the Tomcat project for about 16 years. Uh, I'm not really a contributor per se. Uh, I would like to claim to be, but um, I'm more of a behind the scenes person, I guess. A lot of the code I do for Tomcat is proprietary and it uh, is for paying customers and a lot of the times when you implement proprietary software on top of an open source project, uh, project it's not going to be it's, in most cases it's not going to be allowed to be shared uh, unlike tomcat which as we all know was a proprietary software to begin with now, i've done a lot of documentation updates uh, uh log issues i've done some of the internationalization uh, I've written some patches, and I've been teaching uh, Tomcat and Tomcat deployments for the last 10 years. Now, I have a class on Tomcat, uh, which some of the content in this presentation is from that class, uh, but the class is a uh, solid 80 hours of content. So uh, this is a very condensed time. I'm going to try and get through as much as I can, uh, kind of a high level, and we'll do a couple of examples. Uh, we'll cover a brief history of Tomcat. Uh, we'll have some uh, key points uh, that you want to make sure and pay attention to in production. Uh, we will talk about some things to do and how you do it. And we'll talk about some things that I've seen people do that you don't necessarily want to do. Uh, and I believe I have 40 minutes. So I probably should have checked that. Um, okay. Uh, so a brief history. Um, so the history of Tomcat is very interesting to me because, uh, you know, I've always been a fan of Tomcat and I started looking through the history uh, during my first teaching session. I wanted some content to start the class off with. And, uh, you know, I found out it was it was a lot more interesting than I thought. Uh, and you can see uh, around the time I started my first class, I made this slide, uh, which was in 2010. Um, and uh, since then, I've updated it to include, you know, up until recent times. But uh, this was my first uh, history lesson on Tomcat. Tomcat started by James Duncan Davison in 1996. He was an employee of uh, Sun Microsystems. He wrote the reference implementation to the servlet specification. And uh, that reference implementation is what turned into Tomcat. 
Uh, there you can see a definition of a reference implementation, but it's basically what, what we do now is we take the serverless specification and we implement it in code. So every time a new Tomcat is released, it's a new uh, implementation of the latest uh, serverless specification. Um, so in 1999, uh, after uh, James Duncan Davidson had been working on Tomcat for a number of years, he advocated that Sun donate the project, and they did. Um, there was some initial releases in late 99 and the early 2000s uh, with the implementation of the early servlet 2.0, 2.2. Uh, and this was also the introduction of JSP, which is Java Server Pages, and it was written on Java 1. Uh, so we're talking about a very long time ago. Um, uh, and then after that, you know, it took off and took a life of its own, basically. Uh, so right after the turnover, a new architecture was released. So right after it became an open source project, it was re-architected, version 4.0 came out, which is a lot different than version 3. Um, but uh, the majority of the changes, the most notable changes came around version 5.5. It dropped the requirement for a full JDK to launch uh, Tomcat. We implemented uh, Server 2.5, which was very advanced at the time, uh, the new JSP 2.1, the new Expression Language 2.1. Uh, so 2004 and 2005 was really where Tomcat started coming into its own and becoming a mature production ready product. And now, of course, we're uh, all the way into 2016 and we have, we have Tomcat 8.5. In 2018, we have Tomcat 9. And now if you look at the website, you can download the alpha version, uh, the alpha release of Tomcat 10. Uh, so there's a lot of things that have happened to Tomcat over the last few years. Um, one extremely notable change is between uh, version 6 and version 7. Uh, that is where we made huge advances again. Uh, I say we, the committers to the open source project and the developers of the serverless specification made huge advances with the introduction of servlet 3.0 support in Tomcat 7. And servlet 3.0 introduced uh, annotation configuration, uh, web XML fragments, uh, a lot of features that we still use today that make uh, designing, uh, developing, and deploying web applications much easier. Uh, version 8.5 is another big milestone because we saw the introduction of the Speedy profile or the HTTP 2.0 profile, uh, protocol, sorry, uh, and OpenSSL support for JSSE. Uh, so those are another couple of huge advancements that were made. Uh, Speedy is the, pro the protocol that was written by Google. Uh, it's pronounced Speedy. I think that's trademarked. Um, and it is a, a much faster HTTP protocol, it's supposed to speed up your response times. Uh, and you can really see it in some of the newer versions of Tomcat. You can see uh, that sub 20, sub 10 millisecond response time uh, that you have kind of a hard time getting in version uh, 8. Uh, version 8.5 with HTTP 1.0, 1.1. .1. Uh, you can really see some differences in 2.0. That said, though, we're talking about a few milliseconds. And if you're not uh, serving uh, 100,000 or more requests per second, then you're not really going to notice that much difference, most likely. So if you're not serving more than a few thousand requests per second, you're probably not going to notice much of a difference uh, with a few milliseconds there. Uh, but HTTP 2.0 offers a number of other uh, features as well, um, which we're not going to have time to get into today. Uh, so, uh, mentioning the serverless specification, servlet 4.0, uh, which was introduced, uh, I believe, in uh, 8.5 or 9, I believe, 9. Yeah. Uh, so, servlet 4.0 was introduced in version 9, and that is what you use today. If you download the latest version of Tomcat and you write a web application, uh, you will be using server 4.0 if you design it for the container. Uh, it's obviously backwards compatible with earlier server specifications. That's a big part of server specifications. So you could write a server 2.5 application and deploy it in a 4.0 container. Uh, most applications that you 
that you start working on that are that are legacy applications or applications that have been around for a few years are probably not going to be servlet 4.0 if they are running on Tomcat 9. However, um, there's no reason that you couldn't run on Tomcat 9. Uh, a lot of people probably aren't though. Uh, Tomcat 8 seems to be much more common in uh, in these environments, uh, in these production environments. Let's open a servlet 4.0 application. This is the extent of a servlet 4.0 web ready application. Um, I do have some import statements here, but all of these imports are included in Tomcat. So there is no uh, dependency addition here. Um, and this in its entirety is a web application technically. You can see that I implement the HTTP servlet here. Make sure I'm sharing this. You can see that I implement the HTTP servlet here, and then I implement I override the do get method. Uh, so what I'm basically doing is saying that I'm serving uh, this URL uh, to get request, and I'm returning this response uh, to the get request. I'm also serving the post request, but I, I don't have anything implemented there. Um, and you can implement obviously all HTTP methods in all servlet versions, uh, but we're just, we just happen to be using servlet 4.0 in this case, because you can see my dependencies in this project are Tomcat 9. Um, and you can see this in action. Very easily. If we have Tomcat and we make a new web application called test app, and then we take just that class file from our uh, that we just compiled from our IDE, I've obviously copied it over to this server already. Main servlet.class it was called, and we copy it to the test app directory. Uh, we have to adhere to the servlet specification directory structure, so we have to make a web imp folder, and inside there we have to make a classes folder. Um, so we'll copy uh, the main servlet class here. Uh, I've also put it in a package called example. Andrew, would it be possible for you to increase your font size? That's absolutely on the screen share. Yeah. I thought about doing OBS. I should have done OBS. Okay. All right. So let's turn it up a little bit. Okay. Um, is that better? It'd be better. Okay, so test that main servlet. We'll put it where it needs to be, which is just adhering to the standard web application structure. You know, a web application is simply a directory that's compressed uh, into a war in most cases. And inside of that, you have your web content and your servlet classes will be defined in web inf classes. You no longer need a web XML, obviously. Um, and in this case, we'll just do a test uh, uh, index HTML file. So now we have a test application. We we'll move this test application to the Tomcat deployment folder. Uh, we should see it deploy. I believe I'm tailing the logs. Yeah, there we go. So we saw it deploy. And then we connect to the server. We should see this is a test app. And then if you recall in my application, I wrote this code for the URL. So we append that. We should see the response of the servlet. 
which of course is not working at this moment. You put the org directory in webinf instead of in the classes. And on the server, you should see where the log info statement was called right there. Um, but basically, that's all you need, right? In a servlet 4.0, the point, the point of the example is in a servlet 4.0 application, all you need is a class. And you can, you can deploy an application to do whatever you want with just one class. Uh, so you could proof of concept something very rapidly. You could prototype an application uh, very rapidly. Uh, it's, um, it's a very efficient way to turn out content. Um, let me switch back to the slideshow. Um, so back to the Tomcat configuration, our ideal Tomcat configuration is going to have uh, a few parameters that, uh, you know, I came up with, obviously, but in reality, you know, everybody knows this. You want your production configuration to be redundant, reliable, highly available, easy to maintain, responsive, cheap, and secure. It's supposed to be the last item on here, but it's, it's not on here. Security, it wasn't old. I don't know what happened to it. Um, but uh, those are the core uh, ideals behind a production Tomcat setup. It has to be redundant and it has to be highly available to, for any production environment uh, or you don't end up with good results. It's very critical. Um, obviously, you know, this is a, just a brief high level overview of what you could possibly do, but as long as you take away those core things that it needs to be redundant, it needs to be highly available and it needs to be secure. And redundancy just means that if the server crashes, there's going to be another instance of it available. Uh, and reliability means that the server is most likely not going to crash. But if it does crash, there is another version available. Uh, responsive means you want your response time to any request from a user to be very rapid. You know, you don't want users waiting. Uh, and so, you know, you offload any heavy intensive processing tasks to asynchronous processing. Uh, you don't tie up the UI thread. You leave that UI thread to interact with the user so that they can have a fast response with the website. They don't get bogged down with the web application thinking that it's unresponsive, submitting multiple requests, and causing the application server to be overloaded. Uh, highly available is a whole other uh, uh, definition that we wouldn't have time to discuss in classes short. Um, so from here on, the rest uh, of this would be talking about methods for the actual deployment of Tomcat. You're going to want to proxy to your Tomcat instance. Uh, you're going to want to uh, implement database pooling. Uh, you're going to want to update your heap configuration. And you're going to need to know how to do that. Uh, I'm also going to run over this thing so I have to do like uh, custom GC, uh, some examples that I've seen uh, in the uh, in customer configurations that I've reviewed. Uh, and then we'll go through a little bit of load testing results to uh, show us what, uh, what we're looking for and how to get some statistics out of it. Uh, so why do you proxy in the first place, right? Proxying is, uh, is critical, in my opinion. Some people, uh, some people don't proxy. Uh, a lot of places where I see people uh, foregoing the use of a proxy is on internal intranet websites or uh, websites that are not meant to be accessed by uh, anybody but staff. You know, even if it is a large company with a lot of staff, it's still not a customer external facing website. So. Uh, the developers or the system admins think that there's no need to proxy or that the server can handle the load just fine the way it is uh, and that they have a snapshot taken every so often uh, and the uh, hypervisor maintains the uh, virtual machine so that if it does crash, it has another instance standing by, um, which are all misconceptions in my opinion. I believe that proxying is a good idea because it does provide uh, redundancy and failover capability uh, that is 
court to Tomcat, uh, one of the main things that I wanted to say was all of these things, uh, proxying, database pooling, and the heap configuration, those are the parts of your production configuration that you can control with uh, when you're setting up Tomcat. Obviously, there's a huge, uh, uh, huge uh, spread of different topics that you need to talk about when you're deploying to production. But these are the ones that, that you concentrate on uh, from the aspect of Tomcat, your web container, right? Your proxying, your redundancy, your highly uh, high availability, your failover, and more. Uh, some proxy options that we have, the one that I'm particularly fond of is uh, for free proxy options that we have, obviously, is Apache Web Server, which is a great free option for proxying. Um, but uh, Nginx is also another free option. Uh, hardware, not going to be a free option, but hardware is an option that a lot of people use. Uh, that's why I put it here. Uh, a lot of people are uh, a, pop, a popular load balancer or proxy server would be like an F5, right? Uh, I see lots of customers with F5s, uh, but unfortunately, F5s run proprietary software and they're extremely expensive. Um, so, you, proprietary hardware, load balancing uh, across multiple instances, uh, or uh, uh, open source virtual machine running a proxy across multiple instances for free you know it's a, it's a trade-off there's obviously benefits with the f5 you know if if your proxy fails repeatedly you have somebody to look to and say hey you know what is wrong with this help me fix it uh, but with apache you're going to have almost all of the same features and it's going to be free you just don't have that extra support from f5 you have to look elsewhere for that product support um, which is a lot of what we do uh, at Open Logic is support open source projects like that. Um, and uh, Apache HTTP server specifically proxying to Tomcat in a lot of cases. Um, so back to the list that we that I mentioned earlier for the ideal Tomcat setup. You have redundancy, reliability, and high availability. All those things are provided by the proxy part of the equation. You don't have to look any further. Uh, you still want to maintain this other one. There was secure at the end of that one as well. All right, so we'll have our quick example of the uh, Apache proxy. Uh, I believe I've got a fresh server set up to show how complex proxying is. So I'm going to log into a server that I cloned earlier from a fresh CentOS 8 install. Um, I believe. Okay. Uh, so this is a CentOS 8 release that I just installed uh, for this presentation and it's clean pretty much. Um, so really quick, the first thing I'm going to do is run uh, install HTTPD to install the Apache server. I think I might have done this right before the... Oh, yeah, uh, so I installed it just to make sure we didn't have to wait on it because we are limited on time. Uh, if I go into the Etsy folder under HTTPD, I see the uh, configuration folder. This is the default configuration. I have not changed any of it, um, and I don't have anything else installed on the server yet. Uh, so uh, let's go to off and let's unzip Apache. I really don't have anything installed on it. There we go. Um, so this is just a small virtual machine with a couple of cores and four gigs of RAM or whatever and a small hard drive, 10 gigs or whatever is running. Um, nothing on it. You know, it's like the minimal install uh, or less. It's like the most skeleton installs into us you can do. Uh, but I've installed 
uh, Java, and I've installed uh, HTTP D server, as you can see. Uh, it's called Java 11, and I just downloaded that and did that right before this presentation, so it would be fresh. Uh, so now we've got a fresh installation, and we want to proxy to Tomcat. Uh, let's uh, let's start our HTTP server really quick. Uh, let's make sure we can look at it. Uh, so our IP, our hostname was dev3. Uh, it's not loading, so let's uh, on CentOS. Obviously, you need to add the uh, web port. Reload the firewall. Okay, so there's our uh, Apache server up and running at Dev3. Um, So uh, when we replace, when we create an index.html, it does not use the default page that we saw. It uses our index.html instead. So we know that this is that server and it's running as it is. Uh, so uh, we're going to use uh, slash tc to proxy uh, right now. Uh, so we unzipped Apache. Uh, we're not going to configure Apache yet. We'll just uh, say that we want to uh, let's, uh, change it. Uh, give me some uh, permissions here. Um, so inside Apache, let's just start it up. Obviously, this is a fresh unzip. You also have unzip it, so you'll have to make a few changes right off the bat. You'll have to change the executables to give them an executable permission. We'll probably want to remove the bat files in that directory because they just clutter it up, and those are for Windows installations. Obviously, they're both included in that zip file. Uh, so we start up. It looks like it started properly. Properly, we look at the logs. Uh, we do see that it started properly. And now we need to proxy. Uh, so to set up the proxy, it is literally going to take me, hopefully, no time at all. In the default configuration under uh, conf.d, let's add a proxy. Uh, conf, which conf.d is going to be included by your Apache web server automatically. Let's say proxy pass any request coming in for TC. Uh, and let's pass that to using the eight. We have to specify our protocol here because you can use HTTP proxy, HTTPS proxy, or AJP proxy. Uh, we're using the HTTP proxy in this case. We're going to proxy it to the uh, localhost port 8080. Uh, we're going to add the reverse proxy as well. I should type out this file beforehand. And it won't save it because I didn't open it with sudo. Now let's uh, stop our HTTP instance. Start it. Our server is still up, and let's see if we can proxy. Make sure our server is running. Let's view our page just to make sure everything is there. I'm going to add port 8080 to the firewall. We 
That's port 88 is the default port uh, that Tomcat is going to expose. Uh, Tomcat is running. The only issue is going to be the syntax of your uh, proxy. Andrew, I just want to let you know the session ends in 10 minutes, so if you could wrap it up and have Awesome. <laughs> We're already out of time. Oh, that's great. Um, man, that's cool. Okay. Um, so uh, in addition to proxying, you're going to want to set up, that, set up database pooling. I'm going to run through these last few slides really quick. Um, obviously, I'm not going to get through the other 30 of them. Uh, but uh, a bottleneck is created here uh, because this is the default setup. If you write an application that accesses a, a database, a Java application that accesses a database, uh, and you deploy it on a Comcast server, uh, anytime a user request comes in, uh, you're either going to uh, create a new database connection or use one that you created previously, uh, and you're going to connect to the database and return that information to the user. So every user needs a database connection or uh, the uh, database connection needs to be reused over and over again. So you have a bottleneck there. Uh, and that's where database pool and data source pooling comes into play. Uh, with data source pooling, you allow multiple connections to the database uh, so that requests do not have to wait. Uh, so you allow for some more uh, synchronous processing of user requests and you prevent that slowdown that would happen. Um, but this, this design in itself presents a number of other problems as well because you're, in effect, creating two more bottlenecks when you pull your data source. You've got a bottleneck at your Tomcat instance and you've got your bottleneck at your database instance because you're still limited to one database. You're still limited to one Tomcat instance. So in production, what I will normally do is on the Tomcat side, I will set up a cluster of two to six to eight Tomcat instances, depending on how many, what user load I'm running, et cetera. Um, and then I will talk to the database team to worry about their bottleneck. Uh, sometimes they will uh, just roll with it and leave it the way it is, but sometimes we'll implement another solution or they will implement another solution uh, like uh, Galera, Galera or uh, OpenShift to cluster their databases so that there is no bottleneck at the database. You have multiple databases to read from, uh, and uh, in most cases, one to write to. Uh, but that also helps eliminate bottlenecks. You don't need this unless you're doing thousands of requests per second. But once you get to that level, that is what you need to do. So to implement your uh, database pool, you're going to uh, implement the Tomcat JDBC pool or the Tomcat DBCP pool. And uh, it's very simple to do. The Tomcat website has very detailed examples that you can pretty much just copy and paste into your web application. Uh, the last thing you're gonna wanna concentrate on when deploying your Tomcat instance is the heap size. Uh, you're gonna wanna make sure that, uh, that you have set a heap because you don't want to rely on this default heap values because it's most likely going to be too small to run at whatever application uh, that you've decided to deploy in your Tomcat container. Uh, there's multiple ways to do this. You can obviously use the, uh, the zip file like I did, install Java and uh, unzip Tomcat, or you can use a package manager to install it. Uh, last thing before I take some questions, a very easy way to set your heap, your heap size is to just create a file called set environment, set env.sh, uh, and you export your Java ops. Uh, so if we say xmx is equal to uh, 2g, this should be picked up automatically by the Tomcat container. If we look at the startup of the Tomcat container, we should see our pattern. But we don't have time, unfortunately. 
Um, you want to definitely set your heat. Just remember to do that. It's very important. Is there any questions before I'm out of time? I can't believe it went by so fast. I apologize for not going faster. Let me run through and see if we have any questions in the chat. Okay. I didn't see any thus far. If anybody has any questions for Andrew, please post those into the chat. Um, so we have five minutes left, is that right? We have five minutes left. Um, are you going to be posting your slides anywhere or can you provide them? I will, absolutely. Okay, if I you will provide leave slides a... to me, I'll put them on, I will be putting all of the slides I can get that are presented onto the Tomcat website presentations uh, page. So anyone who's looking for Andrew's slides after this presentation should be able to find them there. Uh, since I have a couple of minutes left, whenever you, uh, when you get done in unzipping your Tomcat installation, uh, you're going to want to set it up as a service. And that's very easy to do, uh, especially in CentOS or using NID. Either way, we're going to use the system CTL uh, installation. Uh, so, let's see, I know I typed this out, let's see, I did type this out. Okay, so we're going to create a Tomcat service file, which is very easy to do. And inside our Tomcat service, we're going to put the standard stuff you put for system D service. Uh, which is uh, unit service and install values. I'm just going to stick to the default setup. You're going to specify your username, uh, which is the user, your Java home, uh, which is user Java latest if you installed from the RPM, your Catalina home, which is wherever you put Catalina or Tomcat. Uh, your options here, which is good, you can specify the start memories um, minimum and start memory maximum. I'm sorry, the runtime maximum. And this is all there is to configuring your service. Basically, uh, let's link that uh, directory. And let's enable Tomcat and we'll run a daemon reload. Uh, but in this case, we're not going to do it because we're out of time, unfortunately. Andrew, there's a question in the chat. Someone's asking if you have any recommendations for heat and garbage collection settings. Absolutely. And I had a whole bunch of stuff. If you want to view my slides, there is some, there is, uh, in the notes of my slides, there is a lot of information on uh, what to set the heat to. Uh, garbage collection, my recommendation is start with no custom garbage collection. The, the GC is so advanced at this point that if you Google uh, uh, garbage collection settings and you, you look for something that looks relevant, most likely it's outdated because the GC has come so far recently. And if you think about how much Java has been updated in just the last few years, you know, 16 coming out soon, you know, it's, you don't want to start with any GC options. You want to run with the default GC and you want to look how that does. And then maybe you want to try highly concurrent GCs, uh, try uh, G1 GC algorithms. You know, change your alg algorithms around, change your new size around, your old size around. Um, there's no one size fits all for GC is how your application handles it. You want to profile your application, uh, view your classes and determine uh, where you know, your classes are going. If they're going into old memory, then you need more old memory. If they're going into young memory, then you need more young memory. Uh, you can use JVisualVM and uh, VisualVM at VisualVM.io. Or in JDK 8, it, it did come with the old JDKs. Um, that would definitely be recommended. And your heap, obviously, is going to depend on the same exact thing. How much memory do you need for how many users that you have running? 
what is the average use per request size. Uh, so it's all about profiling, testing, feeling it out. Um, they'll start with less than 600 threads allocated to your primary connector and four gigs of RAM in production ever, unless you know what you're doing, right? You need those 600 threads for production instances. All right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, for those who are Thank interested you. in continuing on the Tomcat track, Jean-Frederic Claire will be presenting HTTP2, HTTP3, and TLS SSL state-of-the-art in our servers in the following session. Thank you very much. Have a good afternoon or whatever. Thanks, guys.